The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world in America. The rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio. Welcome to Sirius XM's Cars and Culture. I'm Jason Stein in Detroit. Cultural icons emerge in some unusual places. Sometimes they come from individuals born in a country to the north, but have an impact in the country to the south. Sometimes they're from those who create personal touch points, hooks and lyrics that resonate, built around relatable real world stories. And sometimes they end up playing the late show with David Letterman five times. Kathleen Edwards is an anomaly a rare find. She might not be as well known in the United States as she is in her native Canada, but very few Canadian singer songwriters can say that they've walked across the Ed Sullivan stage as many times as she has. Kathleen has that kind of swagger and style. She's played with her heroes, Willie Nelson to name just one. She's played around the world on some of the biggest stages, belting out some major hits. But at her core, Kathleen is cars and culture. She's a car girl writing songs about cars at times and fueling her automotive passion into the hits that she's helped create. Her cultural impact is far and wide. The daughter of a diplomat, she's always had a global view of many cultural issues, including her own struggles. At the height of her game, she left the music industry and started a coffee shop in her hometown of Stittsville, Canada. She called the coffee shop Quitters. She's now quit that gig to return to the road and is crisscrossing North America singing the lyrics from her fifth studio album, Total Freedom, on the 20th anniversary of her first release. Her last album cracked the U.S. Top 40 charts. At 44, she's back in the game, happily. Her story is a fascinating one, fit for a songwriter of her caliber. What would a songwriter say about Kathleen Edwards? Today, she'll tell you. Hi, I'm Kathleen Edwards, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. She is a singer, songwriter. She has made her mark in the United States as a Canadian. She's back on tour with an album out. And more importantly, she's out of the coffee business, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Kathleen, what a pleasure to have you on the program. Hi, Jason. You're in Florida right now, right? You are. Uh, <laughs> you, you you have left the snowy confines of Ottawa, Ontario, or, or more appropriately, Stittsville. And you are uh, you're now a Florida resident, partially, correct? That's right. I, my AC was on the fritz yesterday, and a guy came to my house, and he was like, "Why do your thermostats have all these weird numbers?" I was like, "That's called Celsius, buddy." <laughs> well, you did once write and sing about moving to America, so it's come true. Listen, there are so many songs that I have written that became self-fulfilling prophecies and not because I had any intention for them to be. Um, but yes, I am moving to America. Um, there's a lyric in a song of mine called Empty Threat, coincidentally, and uh, ironically, not, actually, not coincidentally. Not so much. <laughs> and uh, here I find myself in Florida um, and I, I'm i enjoying sort of a... I don't know. I you mentioned that I was in the coffee business. I would have never been able to do this if I were living back in Ottawa and owning a small business day to day, which was really um, it's kind of like putting a saddle on a tornado. It's kind of like riding a tornado on a <laughs> on a saddle, English style, not Western style. So you have nothing to hold on to. Um, so I've I've I'm I'm trying to recover here in sunny Florida. Well, this is on Business Channel 132, and I'm sure there's a lot of business owners who are wondering what the coffee business is like, but more importantly, during COVID, how difficult it was to serve coffee. Yeah, uh, small businesses really were put through the ringer. Um, anyone who does anything that's related to customer service type jobs, mostly I would say, you know, restaurant, bar, food and service, it was uniquely awful. It was awful. And in Canada, we had some of the strictest lockdown measures. Um, and my business was forced to close for periods of time. You can't, you can't build a business around trying to create a 
culture that's particularly a social be intended to be about people congregating, sitting down in your business, and then in the middle of winter, hope that one person's willing to stand outside in minus 30 degree weather while the other person is served their coffee and exits as quickly as possible. So it was, it was pretty awful. I, I'm really, the part of having come out of it, learning a ton was great. It took the Luddite in me and made me have to really learn how to do certain things online that I did kicking and screaming. But on the other side, I'm really, I feel incredibly competent in a way I didn't before. Um, but it did break my spirit because there were a lot of things within those policies that I fundamentally did not agree with. I didn't agree with them when they were being unveiled. And I still don't agree with uh, not allowing somebody one day into my business and the next day I have to ask them for their medical information. Um, that was, you know, that was sort of completely a complete contradiction of the idea that my door was open and anyone was welcome. So I really struggled with that part as a small business owner. Well, and speaking of empty threats, it was not a joke or an empty threat that when your bandmate, Jim Bryson, said, you know, why don't we walk away from this and you can open up a coffee shop and we'll call it quitters. And you said it, you worked your ass off and it was a clean break from what you were carrying and you didn't have to just be a singer anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the coffee shop, like, so it was about eight years. I had this shop for about eight years. You know, probably nine when you think about the year that you spend planning and renovating a place and, you know, in getting a corporation. Hmm. It was really an incredible gift to be walk to be able to walk away from something and, and start a new project that was totally, really just not as connected. Um, I felt really lucky that my life as a musician kind of allowed me to have built in marketing. So the day I opened, I felt like people knew that we were there because I had already built a local name for myself or a national name for myself. Um, but yeah, it was, I think like in anything you get to a certain point in your life, especially in types of work where it's a huge commitment. It's a commitment in your, it's an emotional commitment. It's a time commitment and you spend, you know, your twenties rolling at a pace that's epic and hard to fathom because you're 20 something and everything's new and exciting and you haven't learned how to say no to anything yet. And then, you know, once I got to my late thirties, I was exhausted and burned out and it was really floundering. And to be able to open up a coffee shop where I got to sort of have a whole new chapter of my life was, was such a gift. We're going to get into the, into the cars part of this program, but I want to talk about the cultural piece because you lived in American culture. You immediately, um, you know, sort of, made your way in America when many Canadian um, uh, folks, frankly, just frankly, just didn't really pay attention um, to what you were doing, although they did pay attention after you broke into the American cultural scene, funny enough. But I want to go back to something that you said a moment ago, uh, which was the road traveled. And there was a point in time when you probably felt that maybe this road wasn't the one that you should be on is a night in, in Austin, Texas that you probably remember you were opening for somebody gorgeous room loading up. And someone came up to you and said, Oh my God, Kathleen Edwards, I love your first record. And you were on record number four. <laughs> and you know, you're striving for something, you're working for something, you spend 15 years getting there. And then you realize that someone's judging you based on your first record. So that was that piece of this, I know you've said was very difficult to have to adjust to. Is that right? Yeah, I really am a different, I'm in a different place with that now than I was then. Back then I was when, you know, I still remember that really vividly. The person loved me and was a fan of, of my yeah. first record and maybe they, uh, you know, knew the rest of my work. But at the time I was like trying so hard to do work that, that showed how much I had evolved. 
And, you know, I had come out of a divorce with one of my bandmates. I was dating the guy I was opening for. I really felt like a lot of my identity was me trying to show that I was actually an autonomous person who had this body of work that wasn't based on who I, who my boyfriend or who my husband was. And, and I just felt like I kept getting pulled back, but it was, I was also not well. I was also depressed and burned out and maybe I didn't have the best people around me at that time, sort of in a management role that really helped me put things in a really healthier perspective. Because at the end of the day, that guy was telling me that he loved my work and it shouldn't matter if it was my first record or my latest record, those things you can't control. And I just hadn't found a way to work through that. You did so well. Uh, You appeared on Letterman how many times? Five times. (laughs) Every time was magic. Every time. I mean, David Letterman uh, doesn't have many artists back five times. What was the special connection there? I mean, talk about breaking into a culture. Yeah, I got really lucky because um, the guy who were, who was so I signed to Rounder Records in two thousand two. My record came out first week or two of January two thousand three. So that's now twenty years ago. <laughs> and the guy who was heading up the marketing team at Rounder Records was a guy named Jeff Walker. And Jeff was one of these guys who could sell anyone anything, but very genuinely and sincerely loved my record. And he just went to bat so hard and he called everyone and he got the ear. I mean, they had other people like Alison Krauss on the label and they had other acts that appeared on Letterman. So he had the ear of the talent booker and the person who booked the music and was like, you have to put this record on. And apparently what happened was uh, not only did he convince her to listen to the record and book me, but Letterman also then listened to me and apparently loved the record as well. And his, his show, his team, his producers, the writers, I guess they apparently played the record uh, in at, at the office and, and I was invited to come the day my record was released in America. I played on the Letterman show. I mean, it was surreal. It was a surreal experience. And then of course I got to play five more times. And, uh, I remember I played a gig once in Pittsburgh at this little club, um, club cafe. I remember it just, just now. (laughs) And a woman came up to me at the end of the show and she said, I just wanted you to know that I I'm home visiting family and I am, I actually work at the Letterman show, um, in New York. And she said, and I just wanted you to know, like, that w- the part where y- they loved you was real. They play your record. Dave plays your record. Your record is playing. People loved you. And I just wanted you to know that that was, that was real. Like it, be, we, they wow. are your fans. And I was like, Oh God, of course, you know, you feel, I mean, it's an incredible feeling. It's it doesn't really- get much bigger at that time. Does it? No. And, um, l- The music business has, I'm sure, I'm sure like so many industries, it has changed so incredibly. The first time I played on Letterman in 2003, my record company paid for me to go down to New York with my band, be put up for a few nights. Um, We, they hired me a stylist because I had no fashion sense. I had no clothes. I didn't, someone would ask me like what I'm wearing on something I had. I still am not great, but um, it's just not my favorite thing in the world. Uh, and, and then not four years later, I played on the Letterman show again and they did not want to pay for anything. That's how, because by that point, an appearance on late night did not translate to sales. It did not translate to this big sort of, um, this big escalation in visibility and album sales because people weren't buying records anymore in that very short window of time. Um, So I remember the second and third time I played Letterman, I had to play a show in New York on the same days just to make it financially viable. Wow. How much has the music business changed now? Back from that first uh, 
I don't feel that I'm necessarily a, a great person to answer that question. I think so many different types of artists or different avenues in which you can exist in the music slash entertainment business has evolved and it's very nuanced. So there are people who work as producers um, and writers and create content who are making an incredible amount of money and have, and streaming has been a very uh, fruitful um, avenue for them. There are artists like me who had a record deal when there wasn't even a clause in the contract about digital music. And there are just, there's just a, just such a wide swath of types of ways in which people have found success in today's music industry and people have struggled to stay ahead of the curve when it comes to actually being compensated for their work when they're actually artists that people know and like. But it's become as an independent uh, artist, uh, it's become so difficult to make a splash. It's become harder and harder for independent artists to make a splash. Um, I have a cousin and her husband who have, as independent Canadian artists, it's been very difficult for them to break into the mainstream music scene, band called Fresh Breath. And they say, uh, you know, wh what's the, is it a dark path where, where the industry is headed down or, or where is the light, I guess? Well, uh, it's not an, it's not a, it's not a Disney answer. Um, <laughs> and my answer would be when I started, I was young and the idea of committing my life to something that had incredible risk, uncertainty, um, was not something that I cared too much about because I was in pursuit of something that I just lived and breathed all the time. I was studying, instead of studying for high school tests, I was playing songs in, on my guitar in the basement, um, which I know every teenager can almost relate to. But, uh, but now when I play shows and I'm in my mid forties now, and I have five albums, young women or young songwriters have come, started coming to my shows, which is surreal because I always still think that I'm their age and they all come up to me and I feel, I feel um, obligated to say to them to bestow a little bit of advice. I know that's incredibly conceited of me, but my advice is always to them that this is a really long, this is, this is the long game. Making music, writing songs, touring, uh, being a creative person, building a community. Some of those people are on opposite sides of the country or in a different country. Uh, there are a lot of closed doors and there are a lot of people who aren't going to listen to your music or care and as much as you do. And I really think that I joked with someone the other day that the way to survive in the music business is, is number one, uh, don't die. And number two, keep showing up. <laughs> <laughs> and ultimately I know a lot of people who started out when I was playing music, when I started, who started or were, were already doing their thing. And they have decided that this isn't an avenue that they want to continue going down. Maybe that's because they want families or they wanted to get a job that provided more stability I mean, there's a huge range of reasons. The music industry is not for people who are thinking that one day there's gonna, it's going to plateau and you know, you're going to find this sort of um, consistency and safety. That's why we do it in the first place. There are a lot of people who aren't looking for that in life or don't realize that's what they don't want in life until they're already too far into it. But I don't, it would have been helpful, you know, when I was still on the, on my big learning curve and I, I'll always be on the learning curve, but on the big steep learning curve, it would have been really helpful if someone had said to me, 
yeah, this record might go really well. This release might feel like you're opening new doors. You're going to put out records that don't feel that way. And it doesn't mean that the work isn't good and it doesn't mean you, you shouldn't keep going, but only you can decide that. Hmm. You met some of your biggest heroes. You actually wrote songs about that. Willie Nelson. Is that the yeah. top of the list? Who's still uh, touring, by the way. <laughs> yeah, incredibly. Um, With you. <laughs> 90. Yeah. My parents just drove from Canada um, to Florida to spend Christmas with my husband and I, and they were really a bit shell-shocked after two years of being told to stay inside and that everything is going to kill them. And they, uh, healthy, two healthy 75-year-olds. And my dad was very excited about getting a Tesla. And my husband showed him how to drive from Ottawa, you know, on a long distance drive when in his Tesla. I know you're a big fan of Tesla, so you'll love this story. <laughs> and so my dad was, my mom and dad were very reluctant and nervous at the onset of this, you know, trip. And, and I had a few times, I mean, I had to almost stop myself from saying, do you know that Willie Nelson is 90 years old and he's still playing the Hollywood bowl? Like get your head out of your ass and get in that Tesla and let's go. Come on. Life's not over. So Willie Nelson is a hero. And Willie Nelson, um, you know, he he has certainly outlived a lot of his contemporaries and he's certainly outlived a lot of his friends and bandmates. And it's incredible to see him just still pursue his joy, which is to play for people. But Tom Petty's the he was he's the big hero. Tom Petty is the big hero. Have you played with Tom? No, I played on some festivals years ago um, where the Heartbreakers were performing and Benmont Tench um, is the keyboard player in, in the Heartbreakers. He played on two of my records, my second and third record, which were back, you know, this is 20 years ago now. So 2005, 2007. And Ben Mon and I still remain in, in touch. He's a lovely man. And he invited me to come to some Heartbreakers, my first Tom Petty shows. And I didn't, I didn't realize how um, significant, well, I always loved Tom Petty and he was always my hero, but it wasn't until I saw him live that I was really moved in a way that I was not expecting, like very emotionally and, um, and I never, for all the times I was invited to come backstage or see the show and watch from side stage, I did never, I never met Tom. I met everyone in the band and it was a wonderfully, I mean, it's a highlight of my life. Um, but I never met Tom and partly because I just didn't feel the need to force the opportunity. I thought if it was going to happen, it would happen naturally. And then of course, when he passed away and we, I'd never gotten to meet him, uh, I was really also devastated, which I wasn't aware that I would feel. I was devastated yeah. that I would never, this dream that I had that I would one day maybe meet Tom Petty, but maybe just be able to tell him that, you know, that his, his music is the reason that my life has taken the course it's taken. Yeah, beautifully said. One more thing on music and then cars. You You wrote, interestingly, on the on the uh, first track of the uh, of the latest album, Total Freedom, uh, the song is Glen Fern. And you write quite openly about, now when I find myself looking back, I think of all the cool shit that happened. We had a tour bus with a bed in the back. We bought a rock and roll dream. It was total crap. <laughs> 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 we toured the world and we played on TV, which you just alluded to. We met some of our heroes. It almost killed me. That's pretty revealing, Kathleen. Yeah, pretty man. Cool. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, it sounds true. very dramatic, but there was a period of time in sort of this darker, darker time of, you know, around the time that you described where, where I, you know, the guy came up to me and said, I love your first record. And I was like, why can't I? Um, <laughs> and I, I definitely got to a point where I was thought that the only way out was to end my life. And I knew that I wasn't legitimately wanting to harm myself or kill myself. I, uh, but I just was kind of deep in a depression, a uh, clinical depression. And I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know how to get out of it, um, which 
you know, has its own ending, which is that I got a great doctor and that person medicated me and I saw them every week until very quickly medication helped me be relieved from my symptoms of depression. Um, but it did almost kill me uh, in the sense that it really, it broke my spirit, but it, but it wasn't just the whole music thing. It's, it's that act of, um, it's that act of like actually going deep inside of your self and writing down and making songs that, that mean something to you that are really deeply personal. Um, I, I didn't, I forgot that a lot of people don't do that every day or get up on stage and, and confront some pretty scary things, which is like, here I am. Do you like me? Um, and and that is a, I think that was part of the big learning curve is coming to terms and coming to, to really appreciate that that's a unique thing. Not everyone's up for exposing themselves to that kind of vulnerability. And um, I just, that's just who I am. And sometimes it's, it's a lot. And then sometimes you get proposed to in the back of a tour bus. Um, <laughs> and that's also good too. <laughs> Well, vulnerability in your songwriting as it relates to vehicles, too. Uh, it, you know, the song, I Make the Dough, You Get the Glory, you talk about the fact that you're a Ford Tempo, and uh, or I, you say, I'm a Ford Tempo, and you're a Maserati. You're a car girl, aren't you? I, I love cars. Um, I Yes, I, I love cars. I love, I love people's affinity for them. I love the cultural aspect of of cars. Um, and you know, it helps that I travel for a living. I appreciate them more than you can know, <laughs> especially when you get in a bad one, you're like, what are we doing? Did that start at a young age? Was, was your dad, were your parents car people? Yeah, my dad loved cars. Um, I wouldn't say he was necessarily a fanatic and a, a highly knowledgeable about vintage cars, but, um, but he did. He always loved cars. He always dreamed he'd have nice cars and, you know, set, he was very responsible as a family man. But we had cool cars. Like I, I, we, my dad was in the foreign service and I recall uh, we, we lived in Switzerland when I was very young. And when we were leaving to come back to Canada, my dad went to Lahr, Germany, and we picked up a, an 86 Saab 900 and that was the car we brought home with us uh, from the posting. And they kept it for 25, 30 years. And um, uh, that was the car I learned to drive on and drove, learned how to drive on a stick ship and Saab 900. I can still think of the sound that a Saab makes, which is completely unique to all other cars. It's I, One day I was working at Quitters and all of a sudden, my like memory bank just went, Oh my God, I'm a teenager. And I looked around and I could hear a sob coming around the corner and pull into the parking lot. I mean, wow. sobs only sound like sobs. Yes, it's true. Yeah. Very unique in their day and, and, and incredibly special, but you're also a, you're also a truck person too. You've owned your share of them, including some pretty interesting ones. Let's get into that. Well, my, on my first album, the, on the cover of the record is my 88 Chevy Suburban. Um, I needed a, a large car when I was just starting out in the Ottawa music scene to go to gigs, go to festivals. And I loved the Suburban. I thought it was the coolest. And it also moonlighted as the hotel room because it's a mammoth <laughs> boat on wheels. And sure enough, I ended up sleeping many nights in the back of my Suburban in downtown Toronto, in the Tim Hortons parking lot in Sault Ste. Marie, all the way across Canada. Mm. Um, and so, many yeah. Many can relate. Listen to this. Many can relate. Yes. And of course, being a young woman uh, out, on, out on her own at you know, for the first time, you know, fleeing the coop. Um, I got this big truck and uh, I had to learn how to also park this truck. And so it really, I learned how to, once I learned how to parallel park that truck, the world would never deny me a parking space again. I was fit for life because that thing, once you learn how to park a boat in downtown, in any downtown metropolis, you're good. You're, you can handle anything. You got a new ride now. 
I, 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 I do. <laughs> it's a long way from a secondhand Chevy long, Suburban. <laughs> it's a long way from the Suburban on the cover of uh, Failure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have a, I have a Chevy Silverado uh, pickup that I bought for my for my business a few years before I sold the business, and I, that's become my tour vehicle. Um, thank God I got that truck because COVID happened. I just bought the truck for my business. And then as a touring musician last year, you could not get a rental vehicle anywhere. And so I just ended up driving my truck and I bought a, a used trailer for it. And a uh, hot tip, I'm the only person who knows how to back up a trailer with my truck in my band. So also <laughs> gold stars for me. Um, but now I actually, now I, I am driving around a 2023 Range Rover and it's Ooh, hot product hot can't even get them 225,000 backlog I read recently really so you could flip the vehicle no no you could flip the vehicle I don't know what you paid for it but I guarantee you'll get about two albums worth of uh, royalties if you sold it tomorrow well I don't know if in the United States but in Canada I have to sign a contract saying I won't sell it for a year Oh, well, I'm sure after a year, you'll still be able to sell it. They are, they are hot. So, so what is it about vehicles and music? The motion moving. I mean, everyone, it's that scene in Jerry Maguire where Tom Cruise is driving and free falling comes on the radio and he puts the window down and sticks his arm out the window and starts singing along terribly to the song. I mean, <laughs> people have said to me that they got speeding tickets listening to my song back to me. I, when you are behind the wheel and music is playing, it is one of the most exhilarating feelings, senses of freedom of like independence. It's, it's everything. It's, it's like euphoria. Uh, and I think uh, that sense of motion is also really a creative, I think a lot of people who write music and come up with song ideas and melodies, like I've come up with more of them when I'm behind the wheel moving than I have anywhere else. Hmm. Will the same thing happen with an electric vehicle in the future? <laughs> oh, don't you even. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, we'll find out. I. Uh, you know, I, my husband drives a Model S, so I should just drive his Model S more often and I'll find out. We, 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 I, I, I am an electric car family. We, we love the Teslas. Outside of the giant Range Rover. Yes, I know. It's, it's, um, yeah, I, I feel a little insecure about, t I, it's probably going to, Actually, actually, this is an interesting cultural conversation because there is part of me that is a bit embarrassed, to be honest, that I drive that nice a car. And I think that's actually a real Canadian thing. A Canadian thing, Kathleen. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And I don't know. Have you had that conversation with some of your guests about that about that thing? I have not. But this is a good this is a good area to explore because I think you're right. There is there is definitely a cultural difference, and maybe it's a cultural difference between those who are celebrities in a Canadian context. Although Ed Robertson's been on this program, and he's not shy about the vehicles that he owns, as a good Torontonian in a garage full of vehicles, but. It is true. There, there is a difference between the the um, uh, Canadian view of showing off your wares. So you're driving around in Florida and your Range Rover, and you're feeling, I don't know, should I be doing this? Is that what you're telling me? No, I'm not insecure about the way that I this the decisions I've made about where I am and the you know the car that I drive. Um, I, I sound like a hypocrite saying that because I just talked about how I feel a bit embarrassed, um, because I know that, uh, I think the Canadian cultural, um, thing, I don't know what the word is for it, that has 
made me feel a little bit insecure about admitting that that's the car I drive is the idea that somehow if you buy something nice like that for yourself, you're betraying the working class or the, um, the idea that, that, you know, once you could ever be in a position to buy a vehicle like that, surely you would do something more responsible with your money. Mm, yeah. Um, so, you know, if I bought a cool vintage Chevy, Chevy Suburban and had it blinged out and spent a hundred thousand dollars doing that, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it would not be, would not have the same sort of luxury look that, that uh, a Range Rover would, but um, but uh, I've thought about it uh, as well in other contexts. I, I'm a I'm a creator, and it's actually really interesting. I was thinking about it when I was when you asked me to come on your show. That there are all these people in the world who love cars and are incredibly passionate about cars, and these can be luxury vehicles. These could be guys who love restoring vintage cars and love the history of cars. And for somebody to not understand that and not care about cars and to pass judgment on somebody's passion and somebody's uh, incredible gift for design, for car, for car designers, for car restoration people is really, um, I think, an incredibly short-sighted and kind of small way of judging others who like something that you don't necessarily understand or care about yeah. and that there's room for all these beautiful things in the world to, to exist. And not everybody has to love them, but the people, if you don't love something, then why, you know, express opinions about whether or not it's good for everyone else. I, I find that a bit intolerable. Yeah. We've had, to, we've had car designers, uh, car restorers, car marketers on this program who are, Hundred episodes, and I would I would agree with you. I, I I think that that their their passions are fueled toward those endeavors, and um you know that that might have nothing to do with some of some of the criticism that is that is um, levied on them for sure. Let me ask you a couple more things. You're back out on tour again, and you're on tour. Interestingly enough, after an unexpected phone call in 2018. From a really well-known artist now, Marin Morris, who is a longtime fan of yours and who invited you to Nashville to collaborate on a songwriting session, kind of got you back into kind of back into the game, right? But Marin said something interesting. She said, "I would ugly cry to Kathleen's albums during her own breakups." Marin said she just gets to the heart of it. No sugarcoating necessary if you have the lyrical stones to back it up, which Kathleen Edwards does. Um, well, all right. <laughs> but she kind of Marin kind of got you back into the mix, right? Yeah. Um, I was running my coffee shop and knee deep in breakfast sandwiches. And um, and yeah, this call came in and I didn't know Marin personally, but when she, you know, her team sort of said she's writing for a new album and she's a big fan of yours. Would you ever consider coming down here? I mean, I was so flattered and thought what a wonderful opportunity to, I don't know, just try something new. I wasn't really, I'm not really a co-writer by, it's not something I do regularly. Um, and I didn't know if I'd be any good at it, but it was worth a shot. So I, I spent a few days with Marin and, um, and another guy who ended up actually becoming a producer uh, of some of my work. And it was a wonderful experience because it really immediately reminded me because I'd taken a substantial break from doing that, from writing, from getting into a creative frame of mind. And I remember flying back to Ottawa and just feeling like that I had to I had to uh, return to the pursuit of of making music and writing. That it was a really natural state of being for me, and I felt uh, I felt amazing doing it. So that's always a good, you know, it's your intuition telling you you're on the right track. Have you struck up a friendship with her? Um, no, we're not close. Um, I think we might exchange tweets from time to time. Um, she has had an extraordinary 
and very rare experience where her life, you know, right after we worked on that writing session, that song, um, middle, uh, why don't meet me in the, why don't you just meet me in the middle? <laughs> yeah. And that was a number one bonafide radio, you know, number one hit around the world. And she was the voice of that song. Uh, I can't imagine that she had a lot of time to get on the phone and follow up with people on a regular basis. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so she, you know, her whole star just, just, it went into another galaxy. It was incredible. No kidding. What do you like most about being back? Um, I, I really love connecting with people, which is sounds so simplistic and kind of a little, a little cheesy, but I can't tell you how meaningful it is, especially what we talked about where I was really not well for a period of time. And I was quite insecure and felt like I had not done well in my pursuit of my career and to actually play for people who whose faces you can see and are either visibly emotional, singing the words along with you, smiling. Um, there's something incredibly, I have such a different appreciation for this thing that I do that makes people feel that way. And, and it gives me so much to see people react that way. And um, it really is the thing that I, I think I'm enjoying the most. What's next for you? Going to sell that Range Rover now that I know I can sell it for a profit. Um, <laughs> and buy myself a Chevy Suburban. Uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to make another record. I'm in a period of my life, I think, where... Um, God, I'm going to sound cheesy again. I'm really starting to understand my value. I, I don't know if that sounds... Uh, Anyway, what I mean by that is I realize that so much of my life's experience so far has given me all of these coping mechanisms and all of this um, grit in my pursuit of what I want to do professionally, which is I want to um, write songs and make records and I feel like I have unfulfilled dreams still on that front. Um, and I don't want to be, a, you know, an arena filler. I'm not, I'm not necessarily talking about like, I want to sell this many records and I want to play to a million people every night. <laughs> what I want to do is I, I want to be, uh, I want to be, uh, I want to be in pursuit of this thing that I know I'm really good at. I've, I've lasted this long. And I think in, in like in anything in life, there are different chapters where we, we sometimes are held back and sometimes, you know, we're, we come out of the gate strong and I just am in a point in my life where I'm really excited to surround myself with people who are as passionate about what I do. Um, and I'm excited to be around people who are passionate about, about, the pursuit of that in whatever avenue makes sense to them. And, you know, you're one of those people. You have always been passionate about your work and, and the things that you love. And, um, and you probably over the years surrounded yourself more and more with people who make you feel like you're on the right path. And I don't mean that in some like, Surround yourself with yes men. I mean, surround yourself with people who are open to the possibility that we have great experiences and great things to learn at every corner and show up. And and that's that's what I want to do. I want to be around people who are ready to show up. Well, and if you change your mind, I think you and I should open a coffee shop together. I can tell you that I will not be doing that again. <laughs> I love you, Jason, but I'm not opening up another coffee shop. All unless right, it's maybe. in Florida. Unless it's in Florida. <laughs> the new album is called Total Freedom. 
And uh, she is on tour. Uh, we can You can find out more, of course, KathleenEdwards.com. Kathleen, thank you so much for being on the program. Jason, it would it would not be right to not finish out this this lovely conversation by also giving credit where credit's due. We know each other because of my ex husband Colin Cripps, who is a total car guy. Um, he's and Maserati in the song. He's the Maserati, um, and he actually writes your uh, your the music for your show. He's written the the music for your show, and yeah. he's the one who said you have to meet my friend Jason Stein. And um, I feel very glad that he did. And thank you so much. Well, he is he is my he is my favorite car guy as well. And I took him around a Maserati in Italy several years ago, and he was pretty much beside himself. And that's what started our friendship which led to the music of this program, which leads to you. So all, all roads lead back to Kathleen Edwards. Thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you, Jason. Thanks again to my guest today, singer-songwriter Kathleen Edwards. And to see my interview with her, go to the Cars & Culture YouTube channel. Like and subscribe here to see some 90 interviews. Thanks for listening to Cars & Culture. You can follow us on LinkedIn and on Facebook, as well as on Instagram at Cars & Culture SXM and Twitter at Cars & Culture. I'm Jason Stein in Detroit. We'll see you down the road.